Well, hey there, everybody. I hope you are all doing well on this fine evening. I certainly am uh, looking forward to having a more mature audience. I'm Dinosaur George. I, I, for the last 23 years, I've traveled all over and I teach mostly kids, elementary school kids about dinosaurs. I have a traveling museum where we go from school to school and kind of turn the gym into a museum. Of course, all of that stopped with COVID, but um, hopefully things will get better now that they seem to have a, a, a vaccine for it. So I think things are certainly looking up. Uh, maybe we, we're getting seeing light at the end of the tunnel. And so anyway, I enjoy teaching kids, but I have to tell you, I am really looking forward to being able to speak to a more mature audience because there is a lot of details that I simply can't go into when I'm dealing with kids. I tell you what I'm going to do. I am going, I always have all my settings set up this way, but I'm going to change. Uh, I'll give all of you the ability, if you choose, to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question. If something I cover doesn't make any sense or if you'd like to talk in more detail, please feel free to just unmute yourself and, and interrupt me. It, it was, won't bother me at all. You can also utilize chat. If you would prefer to just uh, send me a message, you can certainly do that as well. And um, I certainly want to thank the uh, Keller Public Library for letting me, especially Miss Ann, for inviting me to come on and talk to all of you. So the lesson is dinosaurs. And, you know, when I was a kid, we literally had five dinosaurs. We learned about five dinosaurs. And the information that we had back then was based on, of course, not nearly the science that we have today, the technology and the, the availability of, of people to communicate instantly across the world. So the entire history of dinosaurs has changed dramatically. I still have some of my first books. And dinosaurs, when they were first discovered, the scientists then thought that they were giant lizards and that they must have lived in swamps. And both of those came from two things. One, one of the first dinosaurs they ever found happened to have teeth that were shaped like the tooth of an iguana, only giant. So that's where the idea that they were giant lizards comes from. Because uh, if its tooth is shaped like an iguana, only it's gigantic, well then of course their belief would be that it must have been a gigantic iguana. So that's where the idea that dinosaurs were lizards came from. Next, because of the sheer size of some of these dinosaurs, they didn't think they would be able to support their weight on land, so they made the guess that they must have been semi-aquatic, spending their time in the water to support that mass. Well, we know that none of those are accurate, and so now we look at dinosaurs as being probably warm-blooded, certainly being fast, certainly living in all kinds of environments, none of which is aquatic with the exception of a handful of dinosaurs. Other dinosaurs were simply not made to live in the water. And an example of that is those big long neck dinosaurs. Those are the ones that people thought they couldn't walk on land. Well, you look at an elephant. It walk, walks perfectly fine on land. An elephant doesn't like being in the water. Yes, it goes in to take a bath, but if it has a choice, it's not going to spend its day swimming. It's going to spend its day on land. Same with dinosaurs. So let me start off by, by telling you something. Some of this stuff may be new. Some of it may be old. But there are two basic groups of dinosaurs, avian dinosaurs and terrestrial dinosaurs. Avian dinosaurs means, of course, birds. Science now classifies birds as living dinosaurs. They are classified as avian dinosaurs. So, Dinosaurs are not extinct. They're still around us today. We see them everywhere. We eat, the, we eat dinosaur meat. So avian dinosaurs exist. Terrestrial dinosaurs are the dinosaurs we think of when we say the word dinosaur. We never think of birds. We think of the dinosaurs. And so the terrestrial dinosaurs is the focus of tonight's lesson. And those are the ones that went extinct at the end of the what is called the age of dinosaurs. So birds are dinosaurs. An eagle is classified as a dinosaur. Hawks, owls, every bird on the planet is now classified. Penguins, 
Hummingbirds. Hummingbirds actually are the smallest known dinosaur. They are the avian dinosaurs, but they still fit in the family of dinosaurs. So birds are dinosaurs. Next, the timeline. Now, we divide up layers of, in the dirt no differently than we use a calendar to divide up a year. We divide it first into what we would think of as months. Well, that center line going down this image, one says Paleozoic, one says Mesozoic, one says Cenozoic. Think of that as sort of the year. Now, they are consisting of millions of years, but just as an analogy. So Paleozoic is the age where life first appears on Earth. The two below that, uh, the Archaean and the Proto, Proto, I'm sorry, Proterozoic are both where life did not even exist yet. Life shows up in the Paleozoic. So think of the Paleozoic as the month. Now think of the words out to the side as being the weeks in that month. Imagine if we gave each week a name. Well, dinosaurs, terrestrial and avian dinosaurs, are both living in the Mesozoic era. That's the one in the center, the green one. And we divide the Mesozoic era into three time periods, the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. So that is the time when dinosaurs existed. The terrestrial dinosaurs all died at the end of the Cretaceous period about 65 and a half million years ago. So dinosaurs were around for an incredible amount of time. Um, they were around for 250 million years. And that's an amazing number considering everything we know about humans closer to 10,000 years for us. So dinosaurs, you know, sometimes that word is used to describe a failure or something that doesn't work very well. You know, my computer is a dinosaur. When in fact, dinosaurs are actually very successful. So that, that, uh, that terminology is not uh, appropriate for the animals only because they first survived for so long. So where did they come from? Well, if we look back in the history of life, dinosaurs had a common ancestor. These animals were called archosaurs. Those animals broke off to become lizards and snakes. Then one main group broke off to become crocodiles, while the others went on to be terrestrial dinosaurs. And then birds evolved off of that family tree, and they became the avian dinosaurs. And birds are related to the meat-eating dinosaurs. They're not closely related to the other ones. You see, there's two groups there, one called Ornithischian and one called Sauriscian. Those names are applied simply based on the hip structure. It's just their hips. So what makes a dinosaur a dinosaur? It's the legs. The legs, that's it. When scientists first discovered dinosaurs, they believed that they were reptiles. A reptile's legs stick out to the side of their body. A dinosaur's legs are more like a column or a pillar. They go straight up and down. When scientists first discovered dinosaurs, they were so convinced that they were reptiles that when they were putting the bones back together that they were digging up, they tried to put the bones together and they tried to make the legs stick out to the side because they knew that's how reptiles stood. But the legs would not stick out to the side. But those early scientists were so insistent that dinosaurs were lizards, they actually took hammers and broke the legs of those dinosaur skeletons to force them to stick with their legs coming out to the side. They literally forced these animals into a stance that they did not have. Dinosaurs' legs go simply straight up and down. Reptiles are out to the side. We can see from their footprints. When we find dinosaur footprints, their feet are very close together because their legs are simply going straight up and down. When you look at the footprints of a crocodile, you'll see their legs are dramatically farther apart and their tails drag. That's a little squiggly line down the center. Dinosaurs' tails did not drag because their body position prevented their tail from touching the ground. So dinosaurs did not drag their tails. So that's the main difference between the old look and the new look. And also, when I talked about being warm-blooded, they're finding dinosaurs in Alaska and all the way up into Antarctica. Now, granted, 
during the age of dinosaurs, those areas were not as cold as they are today, but they still dealt with snow and winter and ice. And it looks like those dinosaurs stayed there. They didn't migrate away. That's not reptilian. That's warm-blooded. So to be a dinosaur, a terrestrial dinosaur, you had to live in the Mesozoic era. You had to have legs that go straight up and down. Another common feature shared by what we think of as all terrestrial and avian dinosaurs is their ability to lay eggs. We find dinosaur eggs. Now, we do find evidence that the big dinosaurs are covering their nests with leaves. And as the leaves are decomposing, they are generating heat. And that acted as an incubator. We find these small and medium-sized dinosaurs were sitting on the nest. How do we know they sat on the nest? Because of one of the most amazing discoveries that came out of China. They found a dinosaur, turned out to be a female. And she was sitting on a nest with her arms kind of in a hugging position, keeping her eggs. There was a sandstorm. This dinosaur allowed herself to be buried alive because the instinct was to take care of the babies. That's not a reptilian instinct. Most reptiles have kids and give them the boot. In fact, a crocodile will eat their own kids in about two weeks. So that is more of a bird behavior to tend to the babies and prevent, uh, protect them. So here this, this female dinosaur say, stayed on the nest and let a sandstorm bury her alive while she defended her eggs or tried to protect them from the sand. So we know that the, the smaller dinosaurs are sitting on the eggs to hatch them. And we know the bigger dinosaurs are piling up leaves, probably finding wet leaves or coming in with a mouthful of water and dumping it because moisture, uh, uh, accelerates decomposition. The bacteria uh, accelerate when it's moist. So bacteria are working harder. It's making the nest warmer. They are using it as a giant incubator. Not that I think they understood their actions. I think there are two kinds of actions in animals, learned and behavioral. Behavioral means they're born with that. They don't know why they do it. They do it, but that's what makes them survive. And that's why they do it. And they pass that on to the next generation. So I think the big dinosaurs instinctively knew this is what I do. I don't know why I do it. I don't think about why I do it because my brain isn't that big, but I do it. So dinosaurs are, think of birds as when you think of dinosaurs or even think of mammals. They're not related to mammals, but think of mammals as far as their behavior and as far as their uh, thermal body temperatures are more mammalian than reptilian. So here is something that surprises, especially surprises kids. There were other animals living alongside the dinosaurs at the same time who are not dinosaurs. They are related because they are giant swimming reptiles Dinosaurs have a relationship with reptiles. So this is an animal called a mosasaur. These grow to be 50, 60 feet long, enormous predators, the size of a city bus, enormously dangerous, mouth full of teeth, very flexible body. But these animals are not dinosaurs for two reasons. To be a terrestrial dinosaur, you lived your life on land. And two, even though they have flippers instead of legs, they still stick out to the side. So as I showed you in this image, if your legs are out to the side, you are not scientifically classified as a dinosaur, even though you may live with them. But hey, that's no different than today. Look in Africa. We have wildebeest, we have elephants, and we have snakes. Well, the elephant wildebeest have a relationship, but it's not close, but the snake certainly doesn't. But we wouldn't classify that animal with the classification of those two mammals just because they share a time and a space. So the same thing with this. And this is the one that surprises at least kids a lot. And that is these giant flying animals called pterosaurs. It's, it's more often called pterodactyl. These are animals that are not dinosaurs. Why? Because... When they sit on the ground, their arms and legs are sticking out to the side of their body. That's how their skeleton is made. The animal on the right is a pterosaur. It is more closely related to a snake than to a mammal or a bird or a bat or a dinosaur. You see the image on the left. That is the stance of a bird. 
an avian dinosaur. Its legs are simply going straight up and down. You look at the stance of the pterosaur and its legs are out to the side. So those are the reasons why those animals are not included within the family of dinosaurs. You know, when you, um, when you look at books and if you have kids or you have grandkids or nieces or nephews that love dinosaurs, any dinosaur book you buy, there's always going to be images of pterosaurs flying in the background. Some of those books are inaccurate and inaccurately will say that that is a flying dinosaur and that's not true. Now, again, it, it gets confusing because there are some dinosaurs that fly, but they're just not pterodactyls. So that gives you a brief overview of a description of what a dinosaur is. Now, again, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to send them through chat. You're welcome to unmute yourself and simply interrupt. If there's something I said that doesn't make any sense, you're absolutely welcome to do so. Okay, so, Dinosaur George. Yes. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. So how are birds dinosaurs? Dinosaurs, living birds are dinosaurs but pterodactyls are birds, but they're not dinosaurs. Okay, pterodactyls are actually flying reptiles that are not related to birds. So pterodactyls have leathery wings. They, they look more like a bat, but they're not. They are simply a reptile that is able to fly that happened to live during the age of dinosaurs. So when we look at the skeletal structure of animals, that's how we put things into classifications. We don't pay attention to the looks, we pay attention to the skeleton. For instance, uh, how many vertebra are in its sacrum? How many sacral vertebra do they have? Um, does the femur connect directly or is it angled? How many holes do we find in the skull? All of those things are what allows us to put animals into family groups. Let's take dogs, for instance. If we find the skeleton of a dog, I may not know what the breed of dog is by looking at the bones, but I can look for certain features that tells me this belongs in the canine family. Once I figure out what family it goes in, then I can kind of whittle down the clues that finally ultimately tells me this is a boxer and it belongs to the dog family. And so we do the same thing with dinosaurs. The reason why birds are dinosaurs is because if you take away the skin and you solely look at the skeleton, bone for bone, they are exactly like a bird, are exactly like a dinosaur, meat-eating dinosaurs. So uh, take a turkey, for instance. We're, we're, we're probably going to have turkey this Thanksgiving. Well, if I took all the meat off the bone and I had the skeleton, if I compared that skeleton to the skeleton of a 50-foot-long Tyrannosaurus rex, I don't want to pay attention to the size, but I want to compare it bone for bone. It is a seven-ton turkey. Tyrannosaurus rex is a bird. Now, we say, well, but it's got a tail. Well, birds also have tails, but those tail vertebra, even though they are smaller and in some cases missing, it still doesn't detract from the fact that its skeleton in whole fits into that family. Does, does that make sense? Does, does that, is that an okay answer? Yes. I, I like this question that someone asked. Can you give an example of a true fly, flying dinosaur? Oh, and that's very good. And, and yes, uh, uh, Miss Andrews, I didn't see your question. Thank you. Um, yes, a true flying dinosaur would be, let me jump to them real quick, would be some of these dinosaurs. I'll talk about them in greater detail, but here's some examples of dinosaurs that were discovered and it, the, the impression of their feathers remained in the surrounding mud. Think of it as if I have a leaf and I put mud on it, the leaf will ultimately decompose and disappear. But left in the mud is the print of the leaf. I can see the veins and I can see everything. Same thing happened with some of these dinosaurs where we can actually see the feathers on their arms. There's one called Microraptor. It's a tiny little one, kind of in the center on the very top row. Microraptor. That one didn't only have big feathers on its arms. It had big feathers on its legs. That animal was capable 
of gliding. And how do we know? Because we can recreate the, the animal and actually fly them in a wind tunnel. We can actually look at the skeleton using technology. We can 3D scan the skeleton. We can add the skin and the feathers to, to size. We can make a model. We can estimate its weight. We can estimate a lot of things. And then we can literally throw it in a wind tunnel and say, well, can you fly? And lo and behold, they fly perfectly. Same way they build airplanes. And so there is an example of a true flying dinosaur, a flying terrestrial dinosaur. Let me show this picture again because it is the meat-eating dinosaurs that begin to become more and more bird-like to where towards the end, a group of meat eaters branched off from those and became the actual birds we see today. And it's all based on skeleton, all based on skeleton. Okay. And, and Miss Mary, I hope that that answered the, the question for you. And, and I can go into greater detail if anybody needs. Okay, good, good. Just want to make sure. Okay. So now let's look at some of the individual dinosaurs, some of the more in interesting ones. First, we're going to start with a plant-eating dinosaur. This comes from a family we call hadrosaurs. That means water lizards. And again, the word dinosaur means terrible lizard. But remember, it got that name when dinosaurs were first being discovered, so they applied the name lizard to it. Dinosaur names are in Latin. Back in the 1500s, Latin was the most common term or the common language known by scientists, so they use Latin. So dinosaur was a name they came up with to describe these terrible reptiles. Had they known then what they know now, they probably never would have come up with the word dinosaur. But this one is called a water dinosaur, and I'll tell you why they called it that. Because remember, I said when they were finding these animals, they didn't understand much about them. Well, this dinosaur has a flat beak like a duck. This is a member of the hadrosaur family. It's got a beak like a duck. And that's the only thing they focused on. So they said, ah, must have lived in the water, lived like a duck, looks like a duck, quacks like a duck. It's a duck. Unfortunately, these animals' skeletons are only found in places that were prehistoric forests. They don't like the water. They need the water to survive, obviously, but they didn't hang out in it. So the name duckbill is what we use now to describe them. But anyway, this is a baby. This is a baby one. But I want you to notice on the one I showed you, it has this great big tube on its head. That is a resonating chamber that is used to create sound. Uh, Miss Beth, a platypus is not a dinosaur, even though it has that flat beak. That flat mouth of a platypus is the only similarity it has with these dinosaurs I'm talking about, but the similarity stops there. They look visually, they look like they may belong, but they didn't. They came much later after the age of dinosaurs and they come from a totally different family. So this particular one has this big tube on its head. And scientists were able to CAT scan it in a hospital and see that it was hollow. There's actually four interconnecting tubes. And so what they did is they used it, they, cre they used a computer program to try to create what it must have sounded like if air was moved through that tube. And what it tells us is that that dinosaur is speaking at a frequency that's so low the human ear probably couldn't hear it. It is making a low frequency sound with that head. That's a survival technique. If you're making a frequency that nobody else can hear, it's like a private conversation. Think of that crest on its head as the world's first cell phone. You can have your own private conversation with it. So that is an amazing dinosaur, and it is a land-dwelling dinosaur. And you can see from its stance that its legs are directly under its body, and its tail is held completely off of the ground. One of the most popular dinosaurs is this one. It's called Triceratops. This is a very popular dinosaur. Now, when I was a kid, this was one of the dinosaurs that we learned about in school, and I loved it. Here is the horn of a baby Triceratops. This is a horn from a baby, kind of not quite a newborn, but maybe, maybe four or five months old. So this is, this is the horn. This is an excellent weapon. It is a great way to defend themselves. 
But these dinosaurs grew to be so large that the big one's horns were eight to 10 feet length. So this is an animal that weighs about three and a half tons and measured about 25 feet long. It's a very large animal. It is an herbivore. Next one, again, one of the most recognizable dinosaurs is this one. This is a dinosaur that is called Stegosaurus. When I was a child, I was taught that those flat things on its back were used as weapons. Now, that's what I was taught. Those are called plates. But the dinosaur had these big spikes on its tail. So it never made sense to me. Why would you have two different kinds of weapons? Did they work differently? Well, this is the spike from the tail. This is absolutely a weapon. There is no doubt in my mind that this is a weapon. But they studied the plate on the back. I happen to have one. Hang on. Ah! This is the plate from that dinosaur. Oh, hang on. My camera needs to focus. Come on, camera. Come on, buddy. You can do it. Come on, camera. All right, there we go. Okay. So this is the plate from the back. Let me show you that dinosaur again. Those things on its back. So this is one of the plates. Now, when I, like I said, when I was young, we were taught these were weapons. But look how thin this is. Wafer thin. This would not function as a weapon in any capacity. A bite into this and this thing would crunch like a potato chip. It's not going to be effective. But scientists noticed that all over both the front and back, there's hundreds of these little trails. These are not cracks. These are actually part of it. And they realized that blood vessels covered this. The whole thing was covered in blood vessels. And then a fingernail covering made of keratin covered the entire thing. So it's exactly like our fingernails. We have blood vessels under our nails. The blood vessels on this animal were protected and they were protected by that keratin covering. So that animal had blood vessels all over the front and back of those plates. What would be the function? Scientists figured out that that animal could regulate its body temperature with those plates. They acted as a, as a thermostat. If it was a cold day and that dinosaur needed to warm up, it could simply pump blood up into the plates so that the blood would be closer to the outside temperature. If the sun is shining, you turn your body and you let the sun shine on those plates and those plates begin to warm up and that warms up your blood and off you go. If you're overheating, you simply step into the shade of a tree, pump that blood up into those plates. Now the blood is closer to the outside temperature and the heat begins to dissipate. And so these may have been temperature regulators built on. And the reason why they needed them is these animals do not appear to have any sort of sweat glands. So they cannot sweat when they overheat. But this dinosaur at least figured out a way to do it. And now we'll talk about the biggest, the largest dinosaurs. These are the ones that truly baffle the mind. I'm going to go right to the biggest one of all. Now, first, the family is called sauropods. We, they are called sauropods. Within that family of sauropods, there are hundreds of different species. But the biggest of all was this dinosaur named Argentinosaurus. When you look closely at the picture, you'll see that human standing in front of it for scale. This is a 130-foot-long, 100-ton land animal. The biggest question of all, how could that animal get enough food in a day to keep that engine running? An animal is like an engine, right? You got to consume fuel or it's going to give out. And the faster you are or the more fuel you burn, the more you've got to eat. Well, when you're talking about an animal that weighs as much as 33 full-grown elephants, you're talking about a lot of fuel being burned. So what could that animal have done? And by the way, I'm going to show you this picture one last time. Its head was not as large as you would expect it to be. In fact, when you look at it, you'll notice his head is relatively small. So how did it get around that? It came up with the most brilliant idea. That is... It stopped chewing its food. They don't chew their food in their mouth. When you take in food, when any animal takes in food, 
if you do not break that food up into smaller pieces, your body will not absorb it. Corn on the cob is the greatest example. If it's not chewed properly, we know when it's passed, it's the same shape it was when it went in. Well, that's because your body only gets to keep it for a certain amount of time. Food has to be moved through our body. If the food sits within our stomach and rots, it'll literally kill us. So we got a machine. Well, same thing with these giant long neck dinosaurs. They can't have food stay in their stomach for weeks on end to be dissolved. So they have to break the food up and especially plants because they're fibrous. Those have to be chewed up. They have to be ground up. So how did it do it? It did it through this miraculous thing called gastroliths. They swallowed stones. These dinosaurs swallowed rocks. The rocks would sit within the stomach cavity and the movement of the stomach, they're called peristaltic waves, as that's happening, those stones are crunching and being pushed against each other. And the plants in between are being ground up. They're breaking apart the fibers so that that dinosaur can absorb the nutrition. If you don't break up the fibers, that's like cardboard. You and I could eat cardboard and feel full, but we die of starvation because their body is getting nothing from it. Same with those plants. They had to be able to crush that up and digest it. And they did it with stones. Birds do the same thing today. Crocodiles do the same thing today, by the way. Crocodiles rely on stomach stones, not for buoyancy, but to help break apart the texture of the meat because they don't chew. They swallow it whole. This is the tooth of one of those dinosaurs. It is shaped like a spoon. It has no functionality in chewing. It couldn't chew anything. It is designed as a rake. They would open their mouth, put the mouth over the limb, close the mouth, pull back, and just rake the leaves right off the limb, leaving behind just the limb. Swallow those plants whole. Plants go into the body. The gastroliths break them apart, and the animal is able to digest the food. So that's it for herbivores. Now, there is over 1,500 different species of dinosaurs. I simply picked some of the more amazing ones and the more familiar ones as well, uh, because growing up, you probably saw images of all of these. Uh, or if, like I said, if you have kids or you have grandkids or nieces or nephews, if you've ever looked at a dinosaur book, you will have seen those. And the reason why I chose those is in the event that you do have young people in your lives, uh, I hope you can share some information with them. Talk about blowing your grandkids' minds. You imagine telling your grandkids that a pterodactyl is not a dinosaur and they'll go crazy and run and look it up and come back and stare at you like, how did you possibly know that? So we talked about herbivores. I want to show you one omnivore. Now, there were several dinosaurs that were omnivores, but I want you to look at that thing's fingernails. Look at the claws on that dinosaur. If it's an omnivore, why on earth would it need claws like that? We believe it was simply for defense to be able to be used as a weapon. This is the claw from that dinosaur. Look at the size of this. That's the claw from that dinosaur. It is hard to imagine the size of these things because we really don't have much to compare them to. Yes, we have elephants and rhinos and giraffes and whales, but we don't see those animals in our everyday life. And so it's hard for us to wrap our mind around something that looks like that, that's walking around with those gigantic claws. And that then brings us to the carnivores. Now, I showed you a picture of one of the groups of carnivores. These are called raptors. These are very distinctively different from all other carnivores because of their feet. This is the foot of a typical meat-eating dinosaur. They actually have five toes. One, two, three, four, and a little tiny one that doesn't function. This one up here is five. That's a little toe. But they actually only walk on three. This toe doesn't touch the ground. That one certainly doesn't. So they only leave three toe prints, but they actually have five toes. Well, raptors are a group of dinosaurs who evolved a special kind of foot. They are small dinosaurs, so they had to come up with a way to be more effective hunters. And what they did is they figured out that if they use their foot as their main weapon, instead of their, hand, their hands and their teeth, they could cause more injury. When your arms are real skinny, 
you don't have a lot of power in them. You can't dig very deep. You can hang on, but you can't dig. But when the biggest muscle of your body is that big thigh muscle, and that is pushing forward this weapon, they made, they made to be very effective hunters. Here's how it worked. When they're walking on the ground, they're walking with two toes down and that one being held up so that it doesn't touch the ground and become dull. Two toes point down, one toe points up. As it walks, it's walking on two toes. When it attacks, it lifts up its foot, it curls down those two toes, and then it kicks, bringing its weapon forward. Raptors are distinctively different from all other meat eaters for that reason. And in fact, um, raptors were the most bird-like of dinosaurs because their skeletons are almost exactly like that of a bird. Their bones are hollow like a bird. They were light and fast, but very dangerous. I'm going to attempt to do something real quick. I'm going to try to change my program because I want to share with you something that is just phenomenal. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't. Let's see if this will allow it to work. Come on, you can switch. Okay. All right, let's see if this works. So I just described the foot of a raptor. There is a bird alive today called a Sariyama. Take a look at the middle picture. That is the foot of a Sariyama. It has two large toes and one short toe with a big curved claw on it. The picture on the right, that black picture, that's the foot of a raptor. Look at the comparison between those two. Sariyamas are birds. We've already established birds are dinosaurs. Here we have a bird who has the same kind of killing claw, that curved claw that the other dinosaurs we're talking about have. All right, I'm going to try to switch back and hopefully it will work. And there we go. And it'll switch me back. So raptors are alive today. They're alive and well. One of them even has the curved claw on its foot. And then we get to the most popular dinosaur, and that is Tyrannosaurus rex. This is the dinosaur that more children know. In fact, they did a study. The word Tyrannosaurus rex is the most commonly known scientific name on planet Earth. It even is more popular than Homo sapien, us. So Tyrannosaurus rex, everybody that likes dinosaurs knows Tyrannosaurus rex, and it's a big dinosaur. This is a dinosaur that was as tall as the two-story window of a house. It was the length of a bus, and it weighed as much as five grown elephants. This thing was so enormous. Let me show you how big they grew to be. This is the skull of a baby Tyrannosaurus rex. This is a little baby, probably a month. Maybe it's a month old, maybe more. But this is how big a baby Tyrannosaurus rex is. This is a single tooth of an adult Tyrannosaurus rex. Look at the difference in size. You're talking about an animal that grows to be nearly 50 feet long and weighs anywhere between five to seven tons. It is so massive. It may have been able to bite off and swallow 500 pounds of meat per bite. That is a huge animal, and it's just sometimes it's hard to get our mind around. So that is a description of what is a dinosaur, some information that what is not a dinosaur, and then some of the individual family members. I will close with this, and that is why did the terrestrial dinosaurs die? What was the catalyst? for the dinosaurs to become extinct. Well, all of the evidence all points very clearly towards a very large asteroid that struck the Earth. It struck the Earth in the Yucatan Peninsula near Mexico. When this thing hit, it hit with so much force and was generating so much heat that when it hit the ground, it quite literally turned the world for a short time into a toaster oven. It was unbelievably hot. Volcanoes erupted all over the world because the impact caused literally the unsettling of the center of the earth, and it caused these explosions all over the world. You had uh, 
uh, acid being spewed up into the atmosphere. You had carbon dioxide, huge quantities. You had gases. You had all these things. And so what happened, we believe, is that some animals were able to adapt to that. That didn't last forever. It lasted, maybe, maybe it only lasted for a week or a month. We don't know. But once it was gone, some animals emerged out of the ash and waste. And those animals were the avian dinosaurs, the birds, the reptiles, the mammals, snakes, lizards, bees, bugs, uh, 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 toads, frogs, sharks, fish. Those animals survived. But for whatever reason, the terrestrial dinosaurs, the uh, swimming reptiles, and the pterosaurs did not survive. It must have had something to do with their body design. Maybe carbon dioxide was much more dangerous to them than to other animals. Whatever the reason was, those animals all died out. And when I talk about the size of the rock that entered the atmosphere, I, nobody ever really explains how big. Let me show you. This is the city of Los Angeles. That is half the size of the rock that hit at the end of the Cretaceous period. The rock that hit the end of the Cretaceous was even bigger than this. This happened to be a comet that somebody used for scale to show you. The one that hit at the end of the Cretaceous period, the big one, was probably twice the size of that. So that is why the impact literally changed the ecosystem worldwide. It upset everything. It, the world was probably blanketed in darkness for a long time. Light couldn't shine through. Plants are dying. Herbivores are dying. Carnivores are falling suit. All of the big animals are dying. Animals that maybe needed a certain oxygen percentage died when their neighbor, the crocodile, didn't die simply because the crocodile doesn't need the same percentage of oxygen as the terrestrial dinosaur. We just don't know. But what we do know is the reason why we know that event occurred, two reasons. One, asteroids are comprised of metals. And some metals are super rare on Earth. On Earth, Out in space, they're common. Iridium is one of them. When this giant asteroid hit, it obviously became liquefied when it hit the ground because the explosion was so tremendous. It turned that rock into billions of tons, trillions of tons of molten metal raining down all over the atmosphere. That that got jettisoned up to 30,000 feet, got caught in the jet streams, and was distributed all over the world. So all over planet Earth, we find this layer of iridium. That's what that, that, was, that was what the asteroid was made of. We find this thin layer that blanket the world. That tells us this was a moment. If I find it here and in Germany and in Italy and in South America and Alaska, if I find that layer, it happened all at one time. Number two, we know it happened because NASA finally found the asteroid. I mean, the impact crater. Because everybody said, if an asteroid 30,000 feet tall hit the Earth, where's the hole? The problem is 90% of it's still under the ocean. And the hole is 180 miles across. If you stand on the edge of the rim, never in your wildest imagination do you think the other side is 180. That's like standing in San Antonio and looking to Houston. So the hole is so big, your mind can't absorb how big it is. But it was a, a NASA, uh, one of the space shuttles was taking pictures of the Earth, and it picked up the, the asteroid crater. So that's how we know it happened. How do we know it killed the dinosaurs? It killed the dinosaurs because in the layers of dirt above the bones and the layer of dirt below the bones, that thin layer of metal is right in between. We find dinosaur bones all the way up to that layer and none above it. That is a conclusive event. That is a moment. Something big happened, and taking all of those things in together, scientists were able to determine what occurred. Looking at how much ash was in that same layer along with the metal, the ash was then calculated, and then it was determined how many plants would have to be on fire 
to produce this much ash? And the answer is the entire biomass mass of planet Earth was on fire for a moment. Every plant on planet Earth was burning at one moment for two reasons. One, as that asteroid enters the atmosphere, it's generating as much heat as the sun. Spontaneous combustion is occurring under the plants. Plants all over the world are just catching on fire. If you were little, you could go under the water, you could go to a cave, you can go underground. You better duck for cover to survive what was going on. And so all of that is trapped in that layer of dirt. But what is not there is how long it lasted, because we don't know. That layer may have been comprised of one week. Maybe it was three bad days. I don't know. But all I can tell you is that NASA takes that very seriously because there is actually a organization within NASA whose number one job is to figure out what to do if something like that ever comes back towards Earth. And they've come up with three options. One, they can simply shoot a rocket into space, land the rocket on the asteroid, fire the rocket, and steer it like a video game. Steer it out of the way. And if they can catch it far enough away, they just have to move it a tiny bit and it'll miss Earth. Two, they can blow it up with atomic bombs. They can fire a missile and blow it up. The downside to that is it's going to come raining down on us possibly, but at least it'll be tiny pieces and not the size of a mountain. Or three, they literally can use space to their advantage. They can pull a spacecraft up to it and the, the spacecraft can simply move the asteroid because two things in space will simply push against each other. It's sort of an invisible wave that's ahead of it. So NASA is very seriously about keeping track of this because of what it did to the dinosaurs. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is my lesson. And I hope you all found it interesting. Um, uh, Miss Hilbin, uh, thank you. That's very kind of you that you found this fascinating. I'm very glad that you did. I hope that you all found it interesting. Um, I have enjoyed very much talking to you. And if there's ever a time that you'd like for me to come do another, I can do a lesson on the Ice Age, which is just as fascinating. I can do one on sea life. I can do all kinds. So I've enjoyed very much speaking to you. And like I said, I hope you've enjoyed it as well. If there is anyone that has a question, unmute and ask it or send it through. Uh, uh, Miss Hilbin, I do have written books, but I only write children's books. I just came out with two brand new first readers for tiny little kids. They're on my website, which is dinosaurgeorge.com. Uh, uh, yes, Ross, there are tons of dinosaur bones in Texas. Absolutely. There are dinosaur bones, but we mostly find them out in the Big Bend area. Or we find them, I'll tell you where we find them, is we find them in, um, oh my gosh, uh, Arlington. We find dinosaurs in Arlington. So dinosaurs lived all over, and we do find their bones in Texas. We had a lot. All right. Uh, Liam, I'm glad that you and your family enjoyed that. I'm glad that you did. I, I'm glad that you did. Uh, and thank you very much, Beth. And yes, oh, the sea life one is amazing because of the things that were living in the ocean. You think these dinosaurs are amazing. Ugh, the ocean was considerably crazier. All right. Um, what's the largest bone that I've ever seen? Well, the largest bone, Wendy, was a leg bone that was about seven and a half feet long. That's the largest one I ever found. It was a big one. That was the biggest one I ever found. The biggest one I've ever seen, though, was probably a seismosaurus, the femur. I think it was, it looked like it was about eight and a half, maybe nine, maybe 10 feet long. It was huge, but I didn't find that, but that was in a museum. That's probably the biggest bone that I had ever seen. And it was fascinating, too. Um, Dottie, I don't know when your next, uh, that would be something uh, Miss Ann can tell you. Uh, I'm sure that she's got ways to communicate. She clearly communicated this one to you. I don't know what that is. Ann, if you're still with us, if you can tell everybody what the next one yeah, is. Yeah, hi. Um, we we don't have Dinosaur George booked for anything right now. Um, we just announced our um, programming schedule, or it's coming out tomorrow for January. Um, but I'm really glad to hear that y'all all enjoy, enjoy today's program. I really did too. So um, definitely look for us to have... Um, uh, dinosaur George back again. This he wasn't. This wasn't our first time with him, um, so uh, I'm sure it won't be our last. <laughs> well, I would love to come back, uh, Mary. You said I had mentioned that Iguanodon was first discovered by the teeth. 
but there were some misconceptions about the dinosaur because they were only looking at the tooth. Might the same be true for Megalodon? Absolutely, yes. Megalodon is a giant shark. When they first found the tooth of a Megalodon, they thought it was the beak of a giant bird because they could not imagine a shark with a tooth this big. No shark had ever been found with teeth that big. So they actually thought when they found it, they were, they were looking at the beak of a giant bird. So, yes, there's been a lot of misconceptions. Uh, let's see. Uh, where do I live? I live in San Antonio, but I go fossil hunting all over the country. I, I mostly dig in the United States. Um, and I, it depends on what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for woolly mammoth, I go to Florida. Or I go to the Houston area. We find woolly mammoth bone, or uh, elephant bones all over Houston. Um, if I want to find trilobites, I can go to Utah. Or I can go to Oklahoma. If I want to find a sea life, I can go to Dallas or here in San Antonio. If I'm looking for dinosaurs, I go to South Dakota, Montana, Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado, New Mexico. Those are the places that I spend a lot of my time. All right, everybody, I have got to go. Unfortunately, I have another group that I have to talk to out on the West Coast tonight, an elementary school for them. It's only 5.30 for them, so they have a 6 o'clock class that I'm going to be doing for them. So I am going to go get me a drink of water and prepare. Uh, Wendy, I've been studying since I was a kid. I'm 58 now. And so I've been studying since I was a little bit seriously when I was about 16. And yes, I have been to Thermopolis and it is a magnificent place to go. All right, you guys, thank you so much, Miss Ann. Thank you very much for inviting yes, me. Yes, thank you, George. Time. We really appreciate you. That was very, I enjoyed that a lot. Thank you. Good. Take care, everybody. Be Bye. safe. Be safe, everyone. We'll see you soon. Take care, you guys. Bye.